Sí, no estoy quedando eso. Uh, thanks a lot um, for letting me speak here. My name is Oscar Hansen, and I'm actually working here in Malmö. And now we will shift a little bit focus then to the dementia disorders and especially maybe Alzheimer's disease. Um, so dementia affects around 38 or 40 million individuals currently, and it accounts for about 25% of a disability in elderly individuals. And the prevalence of dementia will increase quite a lot in the decades coming and especially when in low and middle income countries. And the main reason is of course that the population are getting uh, older and older, but maybe also this increase will increase even further because uh, the Western lifestyle with a changed diet and so on uh, is uh, spreading through the world. And when it comes to the different disorders causing dementia, the main culprit <laughs> is Alzheimer's disease. But you also have, for example, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia. But in these individuals with Alzheimer's disease, the huge majority also have vascular lesions in the brain. There are actually quite few individuals with pure AD pathology or Alzheimer's disease pathology. So in these individuals, you usually have, for example, white matter lesions and so on. But I will focus mainly on Alzheimer's disease because it accounts for the huge majority of cases and also because uh, it's here in this disease that you have biomarkers uh, uh, that can be used. So the etiology of Alzheimer's disease is still unknown, but we know that there are a lot of different factors contributing to a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Of course, the most, uh, the most important risk factor is high age, but also one other risk factor that is very strong is the APOE4 genotype. And I think there are actually not that many disorders, sporadic disorders, we have such a strong connection with just one single uh, genotype and uh, a disease. There are also other genes increasing or decreasing the risk of Alzheimer's disease, but compared to the APOE4 genotype, they have only very, very modest effects. Then you have midlife, I think the pointer is not here, uh, midlife risk factors like hypertension, cerebrovascular disorder, and obesity and diabetes, but also increase the risk of later development of Alzheimer's disease. When it's kind of hypertension, it's clear that it's hypertension maybe 10, 20, 30 years before onset of Alzheimer's disease, but when you are getting more close to Alzheimer's disease, actually the blood pressure is dropping, and in cases with Alzheimer's disease, you usually have a lower uh, blood pressure. Then you have protective factors like education level, physical activity, and active lifestyle. And there are clear interactions, for example, between an APOE genotype where you have a, uh, if you have an E4 genotype, for example, you have much more uh, effect or protective effect of an active lifestyle compared if you don't have this genotype. But what happens then in the brain in Alzheimer's disease? Well, one thing is that you have accumulation then of beta amyloid peptides into C9 plaques outside the neurons. And inside the neurons, you have formation of neurofibrillar tangles containing a protein called tau. And we believe uh, that it's actually it's the beta amyloid pathology that is the driving force. And all new therapies that have been, um, disease-modifying therapies have been directed against beta amyloid. And beta amyloid is then, uh, here you have the amyloid uh, precursor protein. And this protein is then cleaved by base of beta secretase, and a second event by gamma secretase. And then you have a formation of two different peptides, one that is 40 amino acids long, and another one that is 42 amino acids long. And especially this one that is 42 amino acids long has a tendency to aggregate and form oligomers and fibrils that are very toxic to the brain. But this disorder is uh, progressing quite slowly over time. So it usually takes quite a lot, many years between the debut of symptoms until you develop then dementia. But what I want to show here is that the disease processes in the brain probably start at least 10 to 20 years before dementia develops. So it would, should be possible to find biomarkers that can detect the disease much earlier than we have been used to today. And also maybe in the future, it, it would be possible to initiate disease-modifying uh, treatments before onset of dementia. And here is then a, a cartoon showing the spread of neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's disease. And when a patient only has mild cognitive impairment, that is no dementia, it's mainly focused to the medial temporal lobe and hippocampus. Um, but as the disease progresses and the patients get more and more symptoms, you have a spread of the disease, especially to parietal regions and then even to frontal regions. And of course, in the future, 
it, we want to be able to diagnose the disease at this stage when you only have quite limited uh, degeneration and when maybe the changes are not irreversible. So then you need objective methods to find Alzheimer's disease at a much earlier stage. But the problem is then that this syndrome called my cognitive impairment is not only caused by Alzheimer's disease. Some cases have Alzheimer's disease, but others might have depression or it's just part of normal aging or other neurodegenerative disorders. And there are really no objective ways of finding out who with my cognitive impairment will later on develop Alzheimer's disease. And this is just an overview, you don't need to read this, but these are the criteria of Alzheimer's disease, and they are a bit, to my mind, a bit old-fashioned. It's like you need to have certain symptoms, and they need to affect your activity of daily living, and then you rule out a lot of other disorders, then you call it Alzheimer's disease. It would be like diagnosing acute myocardial infarction without ECG and troponin and so on. So in the future, we want to use brain imaging and biomarkers to be incorporated into the diagnostic criteria. So we have been focusing a lot about developing biomarkers, and both to be used in the clinic uh, to have an earlier and more correct diagnosis, but also, as has become more and more clear, we need to find patients much earlier for clinical intervention studies. Because there have now been more than 20 different large uh, phase three trials from different companies around the world, uh, with different new um, treatments against beta amyloid, and all have actually failed in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And there are, of course, two different reasons, either that the drug target is wrong, or it could be that they have been, the patients that have been including have been too um, uh, affected by the disease, and the changes are already irre irreversible. So therefore, now they want to include patients with only mild symptoms, but then, we, of course, we need to find those individuals. So, the, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is a uh, multidisciplinary approach with a lot of focus have been on clinical assessments, but now, as I will talk a little bit here, we also use a, now a lot of cerebrospinal fluid biomarkers and also uh, positron emission tomography. And why do you again use cerebrospinal fluid biomarkers and not blood or plasma biomarkers? Well, the cerebrospinal fluid in it um, surrounds the brain, and there's really no barrier between the brain and the cerebrospinal fluid, as you have between the brain and the, and, the, and the blood. So changes in the brain are usually reflected in the cerebrospinal fluid. And it's actually quite easy to, to tap um, or to collect cerebrospinal fluid through a procedure then called lumbar puncture. And it's a very safe procedure. And oh, you have a complication with a, a headache uh, for one to two days, but it's in these populations, elderly populations, the frequency is quite low. So what biomarkers are we, when are we then studying in the cerebrospinal fluid? Well, one is when the levels of total tau that reflects the neurogeneration occurring in the brain. So this is just a marker that neurons are dying, and it's not really specific for Alzheimer's disease. It, you also see it increase in stroke, for example. But then you have, for example, a beta levels um, that reflects the formation of these plaques in the brain. And then you also have a marker called hyperphosphorylated tau, or tau, uh, phosphor tau, that reflects the hyperphosphorylation state and the neurofibrillar tangles form forming in, in the neurons. So what I will show just briefly here is that these type of biomarkers uh, can actually be used in the differential diagnosis of dementia. Um, they are, for example, abnormal in the majority of cases of Alzheimer's disease, but they're not completely specific because you can also see these in other uh, dementia disorders like Lewy body dementia because you have amyloid pathology in these cases as well. I'll also show some evidence that you can use these biomarkers to see who will have a high risk of future development of Alzheimer's disease. But one problem is that 10 to 20 percent of elderly individuals actually have abnormal levels, even though they have no cognitive problems. And we do not really know yet if this is unspecific or if it is like these individuals will develop Alzheimer's disease if we just follow them long enough. So if we start looking at a beta levels when in the spinal fluid, there are a lot of studies that have been done, quite small studies, but still quite man uh, many of them. And all of them show that in Alzheimer's disease, you have a reduction uh, of A-beta levels in the cerebrospinal fluid. And here's just one example of uh, uh, one of the first studies that were published more than 10 years ago, that the levels of A-beta and cerebrospinal fluid are lower compared to controls. And we, we don't really know the reason for this, but the 
but one idea is that the beta amyloidism is stuck in the brain in the senile plaques. Then there are uh, quite many studies also on uh, the tau levels that are instead increased uh, in Alzheimer's disease uh, compared to um, healthy individuals. And, but the problem here, as I said, is not that specific, but instead you have, we have also used um, uh, methods to study hyperphosphorylated tau. And um, then you can see here is one study, for example, showing that the levels in Alzheimer's disease are clearly increased compared to controls and also other dementia disorders. This is just one smaller study. But what then? Can we use also these biomarkers to, to predict future development of disease? And um, as you remember, my cognitive impairment is a very heterogeneous disorder, and only some of them have Alzheimer's disease, others have other reasons. So we performed um, a multi-center study a few years ago where we included about 750 individuals with my cognitive impairment who all underwent then lumbar puncture at baseline, and then we followed them for at least two to three years to see who will develop Alzheimer's disease later on. We also included patients with Alzheimer's disease and controls that all went, underwent lumbar puncture. And here are just the baseline levels, um, the median baseline levels, then of the different CSF biomarkers. And as you can see here in the controls, and in the patients with MCI that did not develop Alzheimer's disease over a two to three year period, the levels of a beta uh, are around uh, 650 and 700 nanograms per liter. But if you compare that to a cases with Alzheimer's disease or cases with microcognitive impairment who later on developed Alzheimer's disease, these levels are lower. On the contrary, you see a different picture when it comes to tau. In Alzheimer's disease, you have increased levels compared to controls and patients with my cognitive impairment who did not develop Alzheimer's disease. And what is quite striking here is that there's no difference really between individuals with Alzheimer's disease or individuals that do not, um, that only have very mild symptoms and who later on developed Alzheimer's disease. And this was just an indication that these changes might occur at least several years before um, dementia develops. And here, uh, you can see when we, we, we use these biomarkers to try to separate Alzheimer's disease from controls. And here are the levels then of tau protein that is then tend to be increased when in cases here in red that have Alzheimer's disease. And instead, the beta levels or beta phosphor tau ratio is decreased in Alzheimer's disease compared to controls. And instead, when we want to predict future development of Alzheimer's disease, we see a similar picture with patients that later on develop Alzheimer's disease have increased tau levels and lower beta levels. But the sensitivity or specificity was lower wha than what we usually see in single center studies. And the reason is that we have some problems still with this biomarker, especially a beta, that the levels vary between different laboratories. And here's just um, uh, one study showing, um, I've summarized the data from different studies so here you have a beta levels in Alzheimer's disease patients, the levels in different studies and higher in controls. And you see that the levels are actually quite different between different studies. So there, now there is a standardization program around the world to yeah, both standardize the clinical procedures and the laboratory procedures before this can be used in a clinical setting. Um, uh, more now, more than 15 years ago, we started a small study, but it's quite, um, in, in our world, quite a uh, long follow-up. So um, we did perform then lumbar puncture in 147 patients with microcognitive impairment, um, and then we followed them now for up to 9 to 10 years. And during this time, 72 individuals have developed Alzheimer's disease. Some, the 41 have been stable, and 21 have developed other dementias, mainly vascular dementia. And what we could see here, is that the levels of CSF A beta 42, that is beta amyloid, was increased in individuals uh, compared to controls that, that um, developed uh, Alzheimer's disease within a two year period. But it was actually equally changed in patients that developed Alzheimer's disease five to 10 years later, indicating that the cha these um, A beta levels are changed at least five to 10 years before dementia develops. When we look at total tau levels, we see a different picture, but in individuals that develop Alzheimer's disease very quickly have much higher levels compared to those that develop Alzheimer's disease uh, much later on. So we have then this um, finding as well that healthy individuals have 
beta amyloid accumulation in the brain and therefore also change biomarkers. But do they develop Alzheimer's disease or is it just unspecific? Here's just one example of one study where they included 129 healthy individuals. And some of those had abnormal tau and, and beta levels in the cerebrospinal fluid. And then these individuals were followed over time in this study. And those individuals actually with abnormal levels developed cognitive impairment compared to the other group. But this is a very small study. And we are actually in, soon we published uh, another study where we have followed the individual for much longer time and see a similar picture. Um, of course, it would be much easier to use biomarkers in plasma blood because then you can use them in a primary care setting. But the problem is when it comes to beta amyloid that this we have done several studies on this, we see no difference in beta amyloid levels between controls and mild cognitive impairment, individuals that later on develop Alzheimer's disease or those that were stable. And the reason is that there's no correlation whatsoever between the levels in, in um, cerebrospinal fluid and plasma. And this is not very surprising since beta amyloid is produced by many different organs, including uh, endothelial cells, for example, in, and therefore specific changes in the brain does not really show up in, in plasma. Of, we're also working a lot with different brain imaging biomarkers, and I will just focus on one of them. And what's coming quite strong lately, and is actually now approved for clinical use in the United States, is positonal emission tomography to visualize amyloid uh, accumulation. MRI has been used for a very long time, mainly to rule out other causes of uh, dementia than Alzheimer's disease. But also you see specific atrophy patterns, uh, especially, for example, atrophy of medial temporal lobe that could indicate Alzheimer's disease. And then you can also have um, an indication of the brain metabolism by fluorodeoxyglucose positone emission tomography. But here, the, the first substance that was made uh, is called PIB, and uh, looks like this, and this binds to the beta amyloid in the brain. And here is just one example of positone emission uh, tomography scans of healthy individuals where you have some unspecific binding in white matter, but actually no binding at all in cortical areas. However, this is one case when with Alzheimer's disease where you have clear uh, accumulation then or, or, uh, of um, the tracer indicating increased beta amyloid in, the, in cortical areas. And now several studies have also shown that this can be used to predict future development of Alzheimer's disease. Here's just one example of a patient with my cognitive impairment who did not develop Alzheimer's disease within a five-year period. And you see that this picture is quite similar to what you see in healthy individuals. However, this case developed Alzheimer's disease two years later, and you see that this picture is very similar to what you see in, in, in cases that already have Alzheimer's disease. So just to, to make a conclusion here when it comes to biomarkers then for, for Alzheimer's disease and dementia, I think that these biomarkers can improve the diagnosis of patients that are demented, and also can be used to identify those that have a high risk of future development, and actually now there are large trials in the United States um, and also in Europe um, starting to include patients with only mild symptoms who have abnormal biomarkers found in the cerebrospinal fluid um, in clinical trials, for example, immunotherapy against beta amyloid. And there are, I think that within at least a 10-year period, I think that brain imaging and CSF biomarkers will be incorporated into the diagnostic criteria of Alzheimer's disease, and that will help to make more accurate diagnosis in the clinic and also maybe more early diagnosis. And with that, I want to thank you. Uh,